In this episode, we tackle the latest film from renowned director M. Night Shyamalan. He was forecast to be the next Steven Spielberg, and then he kind of made a bunch of terrible movies. But he might be back in Spielberg form with this latest offering. It's 2021's Old. A long day at the beach turns into a surprise day in the medical lab. What are the ethics of experimenting on humans? Should you pull the switch and divert the trolley to kill the one person but save the five? In this episode, we get deep into some utilitarian philosophy, and we also critique the latest offering from M. Night Shyamalan. Come and learn about old. John? Hello, John. Brian, hey. How you doing? I'm good. My knee's a little banged up. A little banged up knee. Oh, really? What, what, uh, what time did that happen? Uh, yesterday on our ascent. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a big one. It was a huge ascent. And today's all decent, I think. And uh, I think at the end of the descent, there's a nice beach. I was, I, I saw a beach on the map. I love a be- good beach. I love a good beach. That reminded me of M. Night Shyamalan's re- most, most recent movie. Do you know M. Night? We talked about one of his movies before. It was um, about an elevator. Yeah, that movie was uh, not as good as the one about the beach. What was that elevator movie called? It was The Devil. We watched The Devil mm-hmm. 2010. Was it 2010? I don't remember the year of that movie now. Yeah, he started off with The Sixth Sense and Signs, and uh, I was review- finding reviews for this movie, The Beach. Or no, it's not called The Beach. It's called Old. There's and, a movie called The Beach. It's got Leonardo DiCaprio in it. Okay. Yeah, well, this movie, <laughs> one of the reviews said that his career has took a big nosedive after his first few productions. And there was a link in the review to a Newsweek. I believe it was Newsweek. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A a, a Newsweek magazine cover from God knows when, but, and, and uh, calling him the next Spielberg. Uh, M night Shyamalan is the next Mm. Spielberg. And then, and then he proceeds to nosedive and make, movies like the elevator movie and the the point of all this is that old is a rebound he seems to be headed back in the right spielbergian direction oh that's how you feel or is that how <laughs> the collective society feels i think it's how at least two reviews i read felt mm-hmm. got it so, yeah. yeah the notable movies he's done for those who aren't aware sixth sense that was kind of i think his most widely early known movie his breakout movie and then he did uh Unbreakable. He did Signs, The Village. Those mm-hmm. I thought were pretty decent. Yeah, I like The Village a lot. It was scary. And then, then it makes a turn in 2006 with Lady in the Water, which was pretty terrible. And then The Happening with uh, Mark Wahlberg. Mm-hmm. The Last Airbender, which I didn't know he made. After Earth, I didn't know he made, which had uh, both Will Smith and Jaden Smith. The Visit, we watched that. At one that point. was about the old people? <laughs> yeah, he made the visit. <laughs> he didn't like that, if I recall. Uh, Split, which I think is maybe his starting in the new rebound, or uh, starting to rebound with Split, then Glass, and now Old. This guy likes his um, one-named movie titles, doesn't he? He does, yeah. He doesn't like to have a... He wants to just conceptualize it maybe to one word, two words. Yeah. Maybe we should do that with our podcast. We could just call it podcast. We'll call it what? <laughs> <laughs> our hike has been up yesterday, down today. And that's the inverse of the trajectory of M. Night Shyamalan's career. Interesting. Yeah, I was, trying to, to feed you, I was trying to feed you some jokes around time, but they mm. didn't stick. That's why I kept saying like, oh. what time is it? And I was like, oh, that's a quick heel in reference to this movie but we yeah, were we were on two different tracks there well i just woke up and unzip my tent yeah this movie is about a bunch of people on a beach and mm-hmm. they age at an incredibly fast rate i think the math works out to half an hour equals one year is that right yeah i have some equations and we can actually use that to test out some of of the narratives or situations more that he introduced and i i've already mathematically figured out a few but if sure. anything, if anything comes up, we can just split off, run some numbers, and see how it stacks up. So you want to? Do you want to run through your your math now, or do you want to 
spice, there's spice in the math later on. Let's do, I'll do a very quick short, I won't even call it a summary. I'll call it a, a, a synopsis of the movie. There is a beach where when people go there, they age at a rapid pace. As you said, one year for every 30 minutes. A pharmaceutical company has leveraged this situation. It's not really a technology, although, you know, the mechanics of it are, I, I didn't quite understand it. Magnets or something. I don't know. Some natural rock formation, which then accelerates time. Anyways, a pharmaceutical company is leveraging this, providing a dose of a medication, an experimental medication, and then having people go out to this beach who have terminal illnesses and then monitor them over time, which just seems like through binoculars, some distant level monitoring to see if their medication works. That's basically it. And so the plot is people come out who have terminal illnesses. They're provided this prototype medication to see if it works. Yeah. And this study, I believe, centered around the woman with seizures. She was the main, that, that was the drug they were testing. Is that right? It seemed like they were kind of onboarding people in continuum. So when the, the yeah, I guess the, the focal point of the family was, was kind of driving the plot, but there are other people who had, who were already there and then people who arrived shortly afterwards. So it was a continual kind of onboarding of new experiments. Yeah, I would like to talk at some point about the methodology of these research scientists. Mm -hmm. I have some I have one large complaint and one still large but slightly smaller complaint about the way they perform their science. Mm, okay. You, and, you like you like to have a crystallized approach to scientific studies and I can appreciate that. When you put on the lab coat, you got to know what you're doing. I agree. I put my goggles on and subjectivity leaves. Yeah. It's just like these headphones. We don't put this on without being well prepared. Yeah. We've spent many intellectual trials to find our place here in the review of this movie. Yeah. There's like seven steps in the scientific method, but there's like a zillion steps in the podcasting method. We started preparing for this movie six years ago before it yeah. even came out. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I found that in watching this movie, what bothered you feels like it's different than bothered me. What bothered me was the feeling that they were presenting situations that just wouldn't work within the nature of the environment that they created. It sounds like the methodology bothered you the most. What's an example of something that wouldn't work like what you said? An example would be, I actually only have two. I was thinking about the scene where someone becomes pregnant on the beach. And I thought, hmm, the metabolism of these humans on the beach and, and how the cell structure is accelerated over time, would the person even become pregnant? Would the sperm die before it even finishes its ejaculation, maybe? Yeah. I'm not sure. No, that, that's a great point. I don't know how long a sperm is viable, but it's going to take as many seconds, as many beach seconds, if we can define it that way, it's to swim. BSs. You know? <laughs> it's going to take X number of BSs to get from the tip of his penis to, to the O-womb. <laughs> and if the sperm is considered biological in the same way as all the people on the beach are, then that's going to be X times... 30 minutes equals one year, however that math works out. And, and, I, and I have the math. You want to hear the numbers? <laughs> yes, <I do. laughs> so a sperm takes about 15 minutes to fertilize an egg from the point of huh. entering and then to the point of fertilization. So it, it just kind of swims around not knowing where to go, right? And it's just dumb luck that it winds up hitting the egg, I think. Yeah, I think it kind of swims uphill like salmon and then eventually hits their target i'm not mm -hmm. sure how random or directed they might be they have their own little tiny sperm compass i'm not sure on those mechanics but there is a time consideration here okay. and in 15 minutes it would have taken the sperm to reach the egg 182 days in mm -hmm. bs time that seems like a long time for a sperm to remain viable yeah it wouldn't remain viable for that long 182 days it only has a five day lifespan so it wouldn't even gotten relatively close to the egg at that point before it would have expired 
Yeah. Okay. So that's a clear problem. It's a what about problem. the food? Yeah. Like they have that big basket full of food. Mm -hmm. If you eat that and it takes nine hours to digest completely, say, then that's zillions of years. So, I mean, food is another exception is my point. It's a good exception as you bring it up. I also don't know if food would rot at a accelerated rate because it's also biological. Yeah. A corpse, as it was seen in the movie, became dust quite quickly. Based on how long that corpse was out there, I calculated that, and that was that was pretty accurate. Within mm. normal limits, let's say. Yeah. Prisca mentioned how many years it takes for a skeleton to decay, being mm -hmm. a museum curator. I don't remember how long she said, though. Yeah. The, other, the only other point I have here is there's a scene which is the creepiest scene at the end, near the end, where one of the cast members, and really there's no real point in looking at any of them individually because they're almost just representing their diagnosis. So this one person has a, a bone disorder in which I guess she doesn't have enough calcium and so her bones are quite fragile. Anyways, she's crawling through a tunnel and as she's crawling there, her bones are breaking and she's kind of turning and the bones are healing at a rate in which it looks really creepy. I don't know if I could describe that any better, but. That would be an indication that not only the seizure lady, but also the calcium deficiency patient had received medication. That's the assumption is that she would have received a medication. And that's another complaint I have. But with this, the logistics are that if you, if you break a bone, it takes about three to six weeks to heal. Hmm. And so if this person's turning and breaking a bone and it looked like they were healing within two to three seconds based on how she was turning and then healing and then turning. And it, you could see the clear split, but then it, the, the regrowing, she would have had to have turned, waited about two minutes before mm -hmm. the bone would set, then turn again for another split, then wait two minutes again. So it's a, it's a little dicey there. I guess it's possible that as she turned, it would split. But the whole, the whole scene took less than about four or five seconds for her to present herself, give her a little twisty state of bone shattering, and then rehealing. Technically speaking, it would have taken uh, two minutes for each bone to reheal. It doesn't fit the scene correctly, but I'm not sure how I would have presented that differently. Yeah, I mean, I'm willing to give the movie some flexibility. I didn't really uh, register the fact that she was healing. I thought she was just growing so old and brittle and calcium deficient that her limbs were breaking in, in all sorts of, even at points where there's no joint. I mm -hmm. didn't, I didn't recognize that she was also healing into, into like a permanent, permanently pretzel-y position. That's kind of how I interpreted it was that like she broke a bone, it rehealed, she moved some more, another bone broke at a different place, but the previous break had already healed at that point. Mm -hmm. So she was kind of supporting herself on, Broken and rehealed bones, but it would have taken two minutes for each one of those uh, breaks to have healed. But it appeared to happen within two or three seconds, or even just a second, second and a half, how quickly that scene went. But My problem with the pregnancy sperm viability dilemma is that the baby that is born dies pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And we're told, the viewer is told that they just put the baby down for a second on the towel and it died of neglect. It died because mm -hmm. it wasn't getting any human touch, any human contact. And I kind of chuckled at that, not because there was a dead baby, but just because of the way that it died. Like they, the movie will take up the tiniest sliver of time on the beach to explain a death. But like you said, it won't also account for a deeper problem like sperm viability. Well, this is a good question. I'm going to Google how long it takes for a baby to die with not eating. Mm, on average, okay, this is a quick Google, 13.2 days. All right. And uh, yeah, it looks like one minute is 12.17 days. Mm -hmm. So if they left the baby for longer than a minute, it would have died. Well, you could apply that same logic to any of the adults or the mm -hmm. young people's hunger if they're not constantly eating. Yeah, I, I get your point. Yeah, it's a uneven handed dispensing of the rules of the beach. Yeah. One red mark for M. Night on that point. But 
in order for this movie to have followed those rules, we would have had to watch every <laughs> member of the cast constantly eating. And that's <laughs> all we <laughs> yeah, just eating and crapping for not to uh, mention sleep. Their mental states would mm-hmm. have frazzled within mm-hmm. seconds on that beach without half of the time or one third of the time being spent asleep. Right. So that's kind of what I wanted to get this out of the way early and and know that we're recognizing the biological and metabolical problems within this movie. And mm-hmm. another one is that the whole premise is that they give them a medication at the beginning and they drink that concoction and then go to the beach. So this medication is a one dose hit. It's not something that you take over and over and over again. You just take it once and that's it. If that's the premise of the movie, I could see that accelerating time would give you a longer perspective on how well the medication worked. But if these are one dose effective medications, then you give them one dose and then you just monitor them for, I don't know, three or four months. And you're like, wow, every symptom that we were concerned about as they came in has been eliminated with just one dose. There's almost not a need to use the beach if it's a one dose cure. I thought that with the in the case of the seizure medication, they gave her the seizure medication and they and they gave calcium lady the calcium supplements and and whoever else needed something got what they needed. Mm-hmm. And then the medication sort of stayed in normal time where it was just the next day. And presumably also the body's metabolism stayed in that non beach, non BS time. Mm. That's how I interpret. So then, yeah, at the end, the uh, researchers say something like she went 17 hours without a seizure or something like that. It, I think it was hours. So they're clearly talking about non-beach time. Everybody's metabolic in terms of their disease and their processing of the medicine. Hmm. Their metabolic processes were not on beach time, even though their bodies were aging quickly. Which doesn't well, make any sense. Either way, to establish a rule set that we can work off of, I'm, I'm flexible. And okay. if, if that's what we adopt or that's what the movie wants us to adopt, I'm fine with that. So for whatever reason, the body isn't processing out the standard half-life of medication as one ingests it. So typically I would take a Tylenol and within four hours it's out of my system or the half-life is four hours and maybe by eight hours it's 75% out of my system. I don't know. But either way, that rule does not apply to the beach. That you take a medication and for whatever reason it stays in your body at the same rate it would non-beach time, even though everything else in your body is metabolizing at beach time. That would also explain why they only ate once or twice. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, yeah. If the stomach and whatever bodily system, nervous system includes the circulatory system more broadly, is on non-beach time than everything else in the body. All the other bodily systems are on beach time. It doesn't make any sense. One last piece, and maybe others will come up. This came up just now in my thoughts, is M. Night Shyamalan is the guy who drove the van and dropped them off and then observed Mm -hmm. them from off the cliffs. Technically Mm -hmm. speaking, if he's looking at them off the beach and they're aging at some remarkable rate, I wonder if they would be talking incredibly fast because he would be observing them at non-beach time as they were being accelerated at beach time. And they'd be, you know, they'd be moving around and fast forward, maybe. And he'd be looking at them and, and, you know, fast forwarded at what one second every 4.87 hours is uh, my calculations suggest. Well, you could presumably do that with the camera and, and audio equipment. You could slow it down in the replay. That's true. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. And I'll just share a thought that one reviewer had, I guess M night Shyamalan does this cameo thing a lot. According to this reviewer, this is Shyamalan's most meta cameo. And, and they go on to say he's the director assembling all of his players on the Sandy stage. So he's not just the movie director. He's also the director in the movie of this little mm. of this little scene on the beach. So I thought mm-hmm. that was that was neat. It's a meta cameo. Yeah, no, that's clever. It's yeah. also a little egotistical, but uh, it's his movie. Yeah, well, you know. There was one thought I had, and this is more about the movie. I thought that the two people having sex and having kids, I thought they were siblings, thought they were brother and sister. <laughs> did you think it was the, the brother and the sister? Yeah, I did. And so I was like, wow, it's, M. Night's taking this to another level. And my acceptance of this was such that they entered the beach as children, you know, four years old, five years old. 
And so what would happen? <laughs> the girl was 11 and the oh, was she? was six. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, okay, so maybe. I only know but, that because I read reviews. Okay, fair enough. But as I kind of thought this was the case, my acceptance of this was what would happen if a, I don't know, I was thinking six-year-old and eight-year-old. If someone who was six years old or eight years old or nine years old started having impulses when it related to puberty and motivation for sex and such like that, they might associate their sibling in ways that are more innocent or more playful than a person who's like 14 or 15. So it's like, as you get older, you kind of differentiate from your siblings and so that therefore you don't find them sexually interesting or whatever. But if you're like four or five, it's the only world you have are your siblings to a degree maybe other four or five-year-olds. But anyways, I thought that was a permissible thing to do in some ways, but it was, it felt a little creepy, mm. but, th- but then later I figured out that it wasn't uh siblings. So. Yeah. Well, I think uh, the sister Trent and Maddox, Maddox is the, the sister Trent is the boy. Then mm-hmm. the, the Trent's love interest is Kara, the daughter of, the calcium deficiency lady and the doctor. They are age appropriate and not siblings. So that's true. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, M night for uh, saving us for my dark, deep thought around that, that I imagine would have upset many. Yeah. Thanks. M night. Mm-hmm. So I'd like to identify the precise medical problem of each character that has one. Can we do that? Sure. Starting with Charles, the doctor, He's under a lot of stress. Right. When the mysterious character of midnight, of midsize (laughs) sedan Mm -hmm. is introduced, he has a lot of paranoid beliefs about him. Mm -hmm. And later on in the movie, he's having that whole episode where he's trying to remember the name of a movie. Mm -hmm. He's got all this performance anxiety while he does the surgery. Right. And then and then he just becomes homicidal later on. He just goes around <laughs> stabbing people. So, doesn't, doesn't put uh, someone who has schizophrenia in a good light. Is that schizophrenia what he has? I wouldn't actually put it in that category. I thought he had stress-based psychosis, essentially, where he was under a tremendous amount of stress. And because of that, that stress then caused him to have some level of psychosis. But under those conditions, when the stress would go away, then the psychosis would go away. And it seems like M. Night is kind of painting people with schizophrenia into a bad light that they would be so homicidal towards others, which they really are rarely are. The bad light that I was going to paint them in is that that disorder is quite challenging and it makes one's life very complex because they have trouble with reality. So I guess my point is that, like, I kind of doubt that someone who had unmanaged schizophrenia could get to the point of professional success as he did. Most so, people, once they have that disorder, which normally hits like in their late teens, early twenties, up to mid twenties, really, then it's such a catastrophic hit to one's executive functioning and ability to test reality. And the medications that one takes are typically pretty toxic that it, you, you it's not, not that you can't function, not that you can't be successful, but to, for him to sustain that level of success and then for whatever reason, just, uh, I don't know, crater into inability to function. It's just, it's not really how the, the diagnosis kind of progresses. So you're saying M. Night Shyamalan presents him as being schizophrenic, but he's not really schizophrenic because he's too high functioning. If, for him to have gotten to the place that he was at, yeah, he would have had to have a pretty mild case of schizophrenia if one would even suggest such a thing. My thought was that he was having stress-based psychosis. But if one does have a diagnosis of schizophrenia and they find themselves under a tremendous amount of stress, that is a triggering event. So it's it's not completely outside of the possibility. It just wasn't the best example for for someone who has a diagnosis of schizophrenia. I had the impression that whatever was afflicting him mentally was new. It was said that he and his wife had gone on this trip to take a break and to get away from work. So there's there's Charles. Uh, his wife, Annette. Is it Annette? She has the bone problem, doesn't she? Yes, she needs calcium supplements. Crystal. 
Crystal, right. Okay, so Charles is married to Crystal. Crystal has the... Hypocalcemia. Got it. I'm only reading it off Wikipedia. Oh. And then there's Prisca, the main character, the mom. She has a tumor. I don't think there's anything wrong with dad. Guy, is that correct? No, it just says he's an actuary. Yeah. Which maybe has its own uh, issues, but... That's not a medical problem. No. And the, the two kids are healthy. So it's Prisca with the tumor, Charles with the whatever, stress-based psychosis, Crystal with the calcium deficiency. And then there's the other couple, Jaron, who's fine. And then his wife, Patricia, is the one with the epilepsy. Right. So there's four illnesses. Mm-hmm. Correct? And then there's whatever's wrong with the... Uh, with mid-sized sedan. I don't know if that's ever said. He has nosebleeds and... Hemophilia. Okay. So maybe it's hemophilia. But he was out there already, and he had made friends with another character who is dead at the start of the of the beach visit. He has some problem with blood clotting. Mid-sized sedan does. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not really... Did he just get there like earlier in the day, maybe? Or was he... I guess, I guess he's still young looking, so he must have just caught the earlier van right out there with m night i don't know <laughs> but he's uh so he's the fifth we have five people with medical conditions that this company warren and warren is the name of the drug company want to study so my small problem with the methodology of the warren and warren drug company scientists is mm -hmm. that you're on the board at this point is that what you're suggesting you're on the board of I, uh, I could run the whole thing yeah and do this podcast at the same time, like as a side project. <laughs> if you're at the only person they gave medication to, I think, unless you count Crystal's daiquiri uh, cocktail with calcium powder that she you know, gets. They all get daiquiris. That's how they get the medication. Right? Oh, yeah. Okay, so that okay. when they arrive, the drinks have the medication. And so that's, that's why it's a single dose thing. And I you. it seems a little uh, unlikely. I but see. okay, yeah. I didn't make so everybody's got okay. Well, that might be all right because I didn't. I didn't understand. I thought it was just the lady with the seizures, Patricia, who had gotten medicine because at the end of the movie, the scientists say that her medicine works so well. I did not realize that, and I thought it was a waste. Why would you have four other cases out there at simultaneously? Why would you mm -hmm. confuse your study so much if you were just yeah? So that makes more sense now. Okay, that's that's not a problem then. Okay, well, the other thing is that, like, the person who has epilepsy, I'm assuming she got her drink right when she arrives to the resort, much like everyone else, yet she has a seizure at the resort. So yeah, yeah maybe it right. takes a while to take effect, but that seems to be a, a, an issue. Yeah, that's a good point. But Okay, so that's that's fine. So my, my more large problem with the methodology is the ethics. Mm -hmm. The ethics of... Running experience on human subjects, this is a big problem in science, as you know. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, postulate a little bit why experimenting on humans may be considered unethical? Well, uh, geez, I could guess a few. One being that you're working with another human, so their life is precious. I think even when you come down to placebo studies, people get upset because you have an experimental drug which might be effective, and you're not having some of the population benefit from it, the potential benefit of it. So then you're essentially for the better of the population, in a sense, setting up someone to absolutely fail by giving them a sugar pill as others get a possible treatment. I don't know. That's one thing, but I mean, ultimately yeah. it's, you're working with a soul essentially. So you have to be understanding to the preciousness of that. Yeah. That's a, two good points, I guess. One is you, the placebo effect and, giving people false hope, involving mm -hmm. them in a cancer study, say, and then they don't even get the real medication. Yeah. And then, yeah, the the high stakes of a rat life, say, versus a human life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And not necessarily within the same range, but maybe giving some credit to a bio company that might pull this experiment is that, at least as it relates to psychiatric medications, I'm not really sure about other medications, is that the time at which people experiment with medications is typically not that long. On average, it's, as far as I looked it up, 32 months. On average, it's 32 months for 
uh, medication to be prescribed, a, um, a new medication to be prescribed and monitored. So there is some benefit to a long-term study because 32 months doesn't show you the long-term side effects. So if anything... You're saying that from the moment of the drug's creation to its approval for public use is 32 months? No, more of that. If I have, exp if I have subject A... I provide them with medications, typically speaking, for 32 months to see its effectiveness. And that's the average length at which one mm -hmm. is prescribed, a, at least a psychiatric medication. And anything that happens after on week 33 is essentially un, unrecorded, at least once it's first released. They might do intermittent studies over a longer period of time to see if there's side effects. You know, you kind of heard about some of the medications related to antacids or um, what was it? Prilosec or something, and gosh, I hope I got that name right to suggest that if someone's taking Prilosec, look up the drug you're taking, and if it's Prilosec, make sure that I'm not giving you false information on this, but I think like Prilosec was causing stomach cancer, and the only way to have known that is for long-term study, and if you're, only, if you're only studying for 32 weeks, cancer doesn't manifest in 32 weeks. So, and how, I guess, how long is so 32 I, weeks in, in beach time? I'm sorry, 32 months. Um, <clears throat> yeah. 32 months. Uh, let me do a little quick. So one minute is 12 points. 30, I said 32 months. Mm -hmm. So 32, 960 days. 78 minutes. Mm. Well, rounding up, 79 minutes. I think. Which wasn't the length of time they were on the beach. They were on the beach until their deaths. Right. So if I guess if they do want to kill them so they they won't be exposed. Exposed the, to whom? The the I mean the company, the drug company wants them to ultimately die so that their secret experiments can remain secret. Yeah, for some reason people going to a resort and then disappearing off the face of the planet doesn't necessarily raise eyebrows, but I'm sure that they they were talking about how as a sweepstakes and people that were vetted unattached people were coming there with terminal illnesses or something like that. But I highly doubt a family of four is completely void of employment or other attachments to where their return to wherever they come from, let's say the U S would be mysterious if they didn't return, you know, but yeah. again, another accepting principle to uh, make the plot believable is we have to swallow that pill. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. Well, I see you raised three good reasons why, or at least two good reasons why experimenting on humans is questionable ethically. Mm -hmm. I want to, I want to argue that the drug company Warren and Warren both behaved unethically mm. and ethically bring them up on charges. And yeah, there's going to be some Matlock style deductions, application of reason. Yeah. Is uh, the murder she wrote episode or Pretty pretty much, it's murder yeah. she wrote and Columbo mm. with a little bit of little house on the prairie. Damn, I'm gonna I'm gonna say. <laughs> so I gotta I gotta first of all I have to plumb the depths of your moral intuitions, John. Are you ready to be to be so plumbed? Oh, it, it's a shallow space, so <laughs> feel free. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you know from all your years studying philosophy, there are yeah, very useful tools called thought experiments. Mm -hmm. which which allow us to imagine scenarios and how we might react to them and, and thereby tease out certain features of our moral intuitions. And mm -hmm. one, one famous uh, application of such th thought experiments is uh, the famous trolley problems. I want to read. Tell me more. Yeah, I'm going to read you a little problem here. This is a little scenario. Mm -hmm. There's a runaway, a runaway trolley barreling mm -hmm. down the railway tracks. Mm -hmm. Ahead, I'm reading this off Wikipedia, by the way. Yeah. Ahead on the tracks, there are five people tied up and unable to move. The trolley is headed straight for them. You are standing some distance off in the train yard next to a lever. If you pull this lever, the trolley will switch to a different set of tracks. However, you notice that there is one person on the side track. You have two and only two options. Option number one is to do nothing, in which case the trolley will kill the five people on the main track. Option two is to pull the lever diverting the trolley onto the side track where it will kill one person. Which is the more ethical option? Well, I think Sam Harris would say that it was already determined before I even showed up to the scene. Mm -hmm. um, 
but uh, and there's a certain amount of guilt associated with making such decisions for myself. How to measure that, I'm not sure. Probably pretty heavy with me, or with anyone, really. So my guess is that, well, I, I, I guess... um Pull the lever. I'd pull the lever. I, I would imagine I might pull that lever. So you're going to kill the one person, save the five. Right. I did not begin this train track. I did not start the journey of this train. I'm only redirecting it. So there mm-hmm. is a force already in play. And all I'm doing is waving off the oncoming catastrophe to make the catastrophe less impactful. Yeah. And and your choice is indeed the standard one given by people who are presented with this trolley problem. Mm, mm-hmm. I'm within the norm. So your yeah, your ethical intuitions are intuitions are at least among those of the majority. And yeah, it's a simple calculation. You're not you're not causing any harm. I think that's the key thing that the lever aspect introduces. You're not you're not killing anyone. You're actually saving four people. And that that's how it feels to us when we when we pull the lever. Obviously it's it's wrong to kill anyone, but in, in this example you're you're not killing anyone, you're saving four people. So in the in the movie, back to the movie, at the very end, when we realize that it was a medical research study, the head researcher basically says something like, We're doing the right thing. We feel we they take a moment of silence for the for the victims of trial 73 as this mm-hmm. group were so named mm-hmm. but they say that nature made that beach exist for a reason and mm. nature wanted us to use it and uh, we're we're going to be able to save thousands of lives just based on the seizure medication results so you you're sacrificing half a dozen people say a dozen people to save thousands and thousands and thousands people are going to die of these diseases so in that sense the train is is inevitable going to hit all these people why is it then that we don't feel the same way about the behavior of these medical researchers as we would about the trolley problem i would say because i'm kind of surprised they didn't suggest this is that the people on the beach are there against their will or knowledge and i bet that if m night interviewed people who were terminal and said, hey, look, you're terminal. I realize that you're going to die of this. Well, epilepsy isn't that big of a, well, I don't want to say it's not that big of a deal, but it's not going to kill you necessarily. Would you take this money to voluntarily go to this beach and ingest this cocktail? You'll die there, but you're going to die anyways. And your death will be, will live on in its impact on society at large. So we'll make, the, you, make a make a plaque as well. Maybe uh, name a building after you. You know, some level of notoriety, some some level of uh, how they say uh, immortality projects. So you're saying that because there was no consent given, that's what makes their the drug company's actions more blameworthy. That's right. I would say without okay. the consent, that's the problem. Okay. Yeah. Well, that yeah. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Do you? Uh, how do you feel about that? Well, I I would agree that. The well in the trolley problem, the one individual walking along on the track did not give his consent. So the function of the lever, there, there's a variant of the trolley problem where instead of a instead of a a track diverting a trolley, I'll, I'll read you the variant here. It's called the fat man. As before, a trolley is hurtling down a track towards five people. You are on a bridge under which it will pass, and you can stop it by putting something very heavy in front of it. As it happens, there is a very fat man next to you. Your only way to stop the trolley is to push him over the bridge and onto the track, killing him to save five. And there's more resistance to this course of action than the lever pulling. Mm -hmm. It's something about taking a positive action, taking an aggressive, actually physically impacting another human. Mm -hmm. That makes it it harder for us to, to do the right thing in terms of utilitarianism, sacrificing one life to save five. This idea of of direct responsibility that we don't want to we don't want to be directly responsible, but so, so through the mechanism of the lever, we're only indirectly responsible, and we feel better about that. I could see it as once I push that man, it would require me to get close to him, and I've established a mm-hmm. relationship, even at its minimal level, and so I I now know that person, 
So it does require a different force from me. So I think that has a, a variable to it. But I would actually say that by getting close, there's an intimacy created and in seeing the person I've created a relationship, the starting of a relationship, just the, the blossom of a relationship, which then would make it more of an emotional experience. Mm. The calculus, the math is still the same, one, one for five. So from that mathematical objective utilitarian viewpoint, Mm-hmm. It's either it's either still right or or there's something wrong with or or you're just feeling it's it's still right and you're just feeling something differently about it. So we ought to we ought to kill the one to save the five, no matter whether we feel like doing it or we feel responsible or we don't feel like doing it or we feel guilty. We should mm. the, the math is always the same. You might be intrigued with the automated car software developers as it relates to this, for they in programming a vehicle to make decisions under circumstances maybe similar, have to develop a programming language which would then steer a car possibly into a pedestrian Mm. or the driver into a situation which might kill them. Yeah, and they'd have to explicitly program, you know, if this, then that. So it would would very baldly and and plainly reveal the the nature of how they're going to build in those ethical decisions. Right. And then there's a legal issue there too, where if the program that I wrote that transports a human causes that human to die or a pedestrian to die, am I at fault for having determined that algorithm Mm. and removed the individual driver from such circumstances? So to get back into that consent, maybe if the driver would have to, in some way, take legal responsibility of such a situation by maybe signing a document, knowing that the program that they're sitting in could potentially kill someone. So I'm almost like agreeing by driving the car that I have consented to mm-hmm. all, all and everything that happens within this vehicle, much as if I was piloting myself. So if I get into a car and, and drive it into a person, I'm responsible to that. If I get into a car that has been programmed to possibly drive into someone, I have responsibility to that as well. Makes me glad I'm just driving an old Nissan Altima. Yeah, yeah. What what year is that again? 2012. Well, these used car prices. Yeah. Well, to to bring it back to the movie, I guess there is a, a sort of consent. I think that the medical researchers feel better about what they're doing because the people opted in for this trip, right? They found the internet link and they signed up and they gave their personal details and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. That at least gets them in the door, so to speak. So if if I'm one of the researchers, it's not like we're out there kidnapping people with epilepsy, throwing canvas sacks over their heads and dragging them onto the beach. You know, Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're enticed there. It's, it's nicer. It's more, it's more willing Of course, the truth of the experiment is completely hidden, but from the utilitarian point of view, sort of greatest happiness for the greatest number, Mm. it's unquestionably the correct decision to run these experiments and kill however many dozen people or so for the thousands and millions, not only live now, but living in the future who will benefit from these medications. Yeah, I see your the permission that's been provided to them. I still think they would get subjects if they just gave cash. If they said, hey, look, you have this condition, mm-hmm. here's some money, you could be notorious or well-known, and so here's here's some money, and go to the beach. And then maybe then you can run your experiment just for the beach equivalent of 32 months and then let everybody leave again. Yeah, you could say just now, now take the boat or swim to the coral. That's another little plot element here mm-hmm. is that for whatever reason, if you swim to the coral, there's a, I guess there's the sphere around the beach that if you try and leave, it will make you have a seizure and then you black out. And then for whatever reason, bounce back to the beach. One individual dies by drowning because he swims out there, has a seizure and just drowns. But for whatever reason, if you swim to the coral, you can get out. So yeah, it's like, here's a timer. And then uh, you uh, leave when this rings, swim to the coral. In fact, maybe you should start swimming to coral as soon as you get there, because <laughs> it depends on how fast you swim. Clock's but, ticking. <laughs> the other thing about these disorders is, yeah, stomach tumor, not great. 
schizophrenia would be great if there was a cure for that. Epilepsy, pretty well managed. I don't really think that's a, a condition that is obviously very difficult to live with, but people aren't necessarily dying from epilepsy. Hemophilia, okay, not a great thing. Again, well managed already. And uh, issues with bone density. I mean, again, like maybe there is a larger population than I realize that's having extreme problems with bone density issues, but I guess I'm unaware of that as being a major problem within the populace. This was Trial 73, so maybe Trials 1 to 72 had some more heavy hitting conditions, perhaps cancer and AIDS and I don't know. So you're telling me this, based on this hypothesis that when you take a medication, it stays in your body. If I took something for ED, elect, uh, erectile dysfunction, and I took that and I went to the beach, I could have a, a boner that lasts multiple years. Yeah, you could have basically a lifer. <laughs> I can't imagine anything more frustrating than that. <laughs> One thing that bothered me about the movie is precocious children. Not a big oh, fan. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, the and, little boy was totally obnoxious. Right. And I hope that when I have a kid, it's on the low percentile of intelligence, just happy with Play-Doh, <laughs> you know, keeps to themselves. I want to be able to impress them their entire lives. Mm. Um, so we're talking like low percentile. That would be great. Take them to the grocery store. They're just pleased by, I don't know, origami. Although I guess that's a little complex. Like yeah. just I'm a devil. <laughs> <laughs> like easily entertained uh, and delighted. They're always happy because even the most trivial thing seems remarkable. That's the kind of kid I want. I don't want some kid that's asking random people on the beach what their occupation is. Yeah. You know? So a couple a couple thoughts about the ending. I just want to sure. share summarize my thoughts about the ending and then I'll share one bit of a review. I, I, I would have liked this movie better if it had engaged with the aspects of the ethics a little bit more deeply. Mm -hmm. I think it's cool at the end how you were taken into the lab and then the lab technician gives that inspiring speech and everybody applauds and you sort of have this, Oh, maybe, maybe it's all, maybe they're doing the right thing. And then you realize that the two kids now age 50 or so, in fact, did survive the underwater water swim and the cops get called and all the, all the missing people reports get phoned to the police and then, and then it's all off to the prison. So you're, you're not left with any sort of ambiguity, ethically, mm -hmm. ethical ambiguity. And then, one review that I want to share. So M. Night Shyamalan's movies are noteworthy for their endings. Mm -hmm. So I think going in towards the end, coming for the final approach, you're expecting a shocking, a shocker. And I suppose you get it with the lab um, reveal as it is. But this is a quote. Sadly, the film crashes when it decides to offer some sane explanations and connect dots that didn't really need to be connected. And, and the context of this quote is that the reviewer was saying that the movie didn't really play around enough with our anxiety about getting older. It didn't really do that with enough nuance, especially for parents watching their kids grow up and realizing that they're not going to, that, that the parents are not going to be alive to see their kids entire life. There's all this anxiety around parenthood that, that this movie could have explored. I think was, was what the reviewer was saying. Anyway, the film crashes when it decides to offer some sane explanations and connect dots that didn't really need to be connected. There's a much stronger version of old that ends more ambiguously, allowing viewers to leave the theater playing around with themes instead of unpacking exactly what was going on, which is what the movie did. Mm -hmm. The conversation around Shyamalan often focuses on his final scenes, and I, the reviewer, found the ones in old some of his most frustrating given how they feel oppositional to what, to what works best about the movie, all the anxiety about getting old. I could agree with that. I, I was hoping to see the terror of getting old in itself mm -hmm. being piloted, but it really, it did a little bit, but very little. Yeah, no, everybody kind of just gets cool with their eminent mortality, like the two, the two parents. Uh, dad is now has a lot of vision problems and and they they can't really remember what was the reason for all their marital strife and they're 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 old sort of old and doty at that point and they they just kind of stare into the water and and die together you know that's great but it's yeah it doesn't doesn't explore the the pants shitting terror that we all have <laughs> actually getting old and dying <laughs> yeah and uh, I would say that 
because it didn't explore that, I had some level of relief because I thought that would be the most terrifying part of the movie. And I reflected on that and thought, well, if I found myself in a situation in which the rest of my life would be would take place at a beach, hey, it's not so bad. You mm. know what I'm saying? Of of the options, you know, I wasn't I didn't go to war. I didn't like live 40 years in a miserable place of employment. Yeah, I, there's, there's plenty of pasta salad in bags. Yeah, just eat pasta salad and sit on the beach for the rest of your life. I mean, that's I mean, you're basically given an early vacation. Yeah. No, yeah. It's like, like what everybody's retirement retirement yeah. dreams are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, yeah. You, and you have at, at least for a large part of that last day, you have most of your physical powers and mental faculties still in check. This is the thing. This is what I'm talking about. I have a terminal illness. What I'm facing here is a declining health of misery. You know what? MS would be a good example. I can either experience MS over time and lose my faculties, or I can spend the rest of my life on a beach and enjoy the rest of my life this way. Maybe bring a friend unknowingly yeah. And, yeah. and murder <laughs> them by bringing them on this trip with you. Wait, there's, uh, there's the beach at the end of our hike today, isn't there? <laughs> and the last little piece here on the ethics is that not everyone had a terminal illness. Those children didn't have terminal illnesses mm -hmm. and they were brought into this experiment and their lives were just budding and they were extinguished quite early through this process. So, you know, getting up and celebrating and, uh, you know, having champagne at experiment number 73 or whatever. What about all the casualties that that came of that experiment beyond those that were terminal? That's a fair point. Speaking of time, uh, yeah. we're reaching the end of this uh, journey of of a movie review. Yeah, I think that it's time to start walking down these very steep, magnetically anomalous rocks. <laughs> yeah, I brought uh, Jenga for us to play on the beach until we <laughs> <laughs> play Jenga over and over and over again. I, I do like a few uh, hours of Jenga, so that sounds perfect. <laughs> well, it's been good knowing you, Brian. Yeah, it's been uh, a pleasure. I, I guess I'm going to die not knowing what the M in M. Night Shyamalan stands for. Do you know what the M stands for? Uh, Is it like Matthew? Mike? Is it Mike? Well, <laughs> Mike? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's, uh, it looks like it's M-A-N-O-J. Menage. Menage, yeah. <laughs> Menage Night Shyamalan. I would have I I gone Menage Night S. I think that would have been Menage Knight S. I don't think Knight's actually part of his name. He just injected that on his own. Oh, looks like he's got some some things to answer for. Yeah, he does. Yeah. Well, uh, pleasure. I, as always, 